Yeah, it's official. Recording's in progress. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. My name is John Garbett. I'm the Director of Membership and Investor Relations here at the Chamber. Our Small Business Solutions Hub was created as a digital resource designed to connect small business chamber members to a network of local experts and partners, business advising services, and a library of chamber education tools. The hub continues to evolve to meet local needs with quarterly business education programming, like this one today, and also provides helpful information from local investors. You can find the digital resource hub on our website. These programs would not be possible without our title sponsor, Kaiser Permanente, and our investors, Ask Eric Computer Services, Belfour Property Restoration, Chambers Construction, Eugene Area Radio Stations, Hirschner Hunter, Hutchinson Cox, OCCU, and Wafed Bank. Let's give them a round of applause. Before we get into today's program, I would like to invite our title sponsor, Kaiser Permanente, to say a few words. Please help me in welcoming Colleen Lawson. Thank you all. Can you hear me? All right. Well, I appreciate it. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I had planned to be. Um, however, I came up to Portland to attend the Portland Business Journal Healthcare of the Future event and awards. And I share that because the award was given to um, a um, generative AI drug discovery organization that's located here in the state of Oregon. And it was a very interesting story of, um, of what they do uh, to bring new drugs to the market much faster because of using generative AI. Um, but they also talked about the concerns. And I think the topic today, and I like the way that today's session was advertised, which is, let's look at the, the things that AI can do for the good of humanity, the good of business, and you know what are some of the dark sides or some of the dangers that we all need to be thinking about as we look to incorporate this into um, our way of life. Quite frankly, we could talk about it. We're sort of in the infancy of it, and we're using words that don't even roll off the tongue quite yet. But make no mistake, this is going to be our future. This is going to be in every part of the way people go to market. Uh, and the way that they hire um, employees, uh, the way every every process that um, they are considering as they uh, develop and build new businesses and solve new problems, which is really what this this team of people that are here today are small business entrepreneurs. They're innovators. You just are an innovator by the nature of the fact that you have a small business or considering a small business. So. Um, uh, hats off to you all for uh, taking the time out to educate yourself, find a community, and to participate. We appreciate it, and we're um, you know very grateful to the chamber for this opportunity. Um, obviously, we're here in Lane County, and we think it's important that um, you all, uh, in order to continue to thrive, um, have access to the highest quality healthcare. And we believe that that's a, a product that we can deliver to you and your family members. So consider us um, as you think about uh, the healthcare needs that you have. We serve all of Lane County um, and all lines of business. So from Medicare to individual to groups, we're here to serve your needs. And you know that I'm around and you can reach me. I'm Colleen Lawson at kp.org. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to today's session. Thank you, Colleen. As you know, this is a hybrid event. So if you are a virtual attendee, please put questions in the chat and we'll make sure to get to them. Also, uh, as you know, we're, we're recording this program so you can find it in our digital um, small business solutions hub on our website. And uh, we'll also send out uh, the program after the, uh, after the event. All right, moving on to our programming. Today, we have two presentations focused on AI, 
and how your business can take advantage of this new technology. We are joined by Eric Dreyer-Goldman, CEO of Ask Eric Computer Services, and by Chuck Dinsfriend, Information Technology Manager for Willamalane Park and Recreation Des District. After each presentation, we will take a few minutes for questions from both the in-person and virtual attendees. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Eric Dreyer-Goldman. Eric is a seasoned IT professional with over 40 years of experience in the industry. As the founder and owner of Ask Eric Computer Services, Eric has been at the forefront of providing cutting edge technology solutions to businesses since 2006. He is Microsoft certified and a Microsoft partner. In addition to his IT experience, Eric is also a dedicated family man, happily married to his wife Ivy for 30 years, when he's not shaping the future of technology, you'll find Eric walking his dog, attending concerts, cheering for the ducks at sporting events, enjoying fishing, and selflessly volunteering for multiple organizations. Please help me give a warm welcome to Eric Dreyer-Goldman. Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, Glad to have you all here today. It's a very exciting topic that we're having today. And AI can be really confusing for a lot of us. Uh, there's several of us that have been using it for a long time and then others that are just getting into it. It's actually been around for quite a bit of time and we're just starting to see it now in the public. And what I don't know if you guys know is that the first million people to use ChatGPT happened quicker than any other online platform in existence. And that includes Amazon, Netflix, Facebook. Uh, the adoption rate happened very quickly and uh, rapidly expanding. And they actually had to put a halt on things a few months ago because uh, the AI was getting so advanced and they didn't know where things were gonna go and they didn't want people to do things that they weren't supposed to do. So basically right here, uh, artificial intelligence is basically, or AI uh, is a field of computer science that involves uh, creation of machines that work and react like humans with its ability to learn, reason and self-correct AI is being used in a wide variety of business applications. And it's also like a robot in the brain. Uh, imagine if you would, uh, if you have some toys and they could actually think and do things uh, based on what the person wanted. And like when you play video games, for example, uh, when things happen in the video games, AI kicks in when you're going from one place to the other and it decides what it's gonna do on the other end as well. Uh, and it's created by programmers and they write instructions and then end users write prompts and these prompts allow you to get information and the more detailed you are with these prompts, the more accurate information that you can get. And it, there's a whole science to it and uh, they're paying people huge amounts of money in order to learn how to write these prompts. And the more that you get into thinking like a computer and thinking like a human, it helps the AI and it takes that information and it learns from it, which is really interesting. But don't worry, even though AI is smart, it doesn't have feelings or thoughts uh, like humans do. And it's just a tool to hopefully make things easier and allow people to have fun. AI is not a new concept. Uh, in some capacity, AI has been part of our daily life for decades. Development sped up recently, inspired by deep learning. As you can see here on this chart, the first mechanical uh, calculating machine was built back in 1642. And then AI uh, was really coined in 1955 at a conference that was on AI, and we've been referring to it as AI ever since. And there's been different uh, reiterations over the years showing the AI timeline in this show here. So uh, how is AI relevant to small business? 
Well, incorporating AI in small business operations can lead to improved efficiency, increased profitability, and enhanced customer experiences. However, it's important for businesses to understand that successful AI implementation uh, requires a clear strategy, objectives, and should follow an internal AI policy that follows along with either your mission and your goals. AI can help sort through emails. It can categorize them based on their importance. It can save employees a lot of time every day that they'd otherwise spend on manually sorting these emails. Chatbots can handle all sorts of objections, inquiries, freeing up time for customer service representatives. It's really powerful in that area. And it can also handle more complex issues. AI can automate the process of entering data in spreadsheets or databases and reduces the chance of human error, increasing efficiency. It can also assist in scheduling meetings by finding common free times in a participant schedule and booking the meetings for them in a common slot that they have. I know we're all busy on a regular basis and we don't always have the time to figure out when to meet, but with AI, you're gonna be able to start using that so it will be able to schedule things for you on common calendars. AI can also monitor social media, allowing employees to quickly respond for customer feedback. And in these days, uh, it's really critical for your brand to be able to uh, speak to your customers and the way that they wanna be communicated with. And the nice thing about AI is that it's pretty instantaneous. There's also a strategic task that can uh, significantly increase productivity and efficiency. There's lots of cost savings. By automating the task, AI can reduce the need for human intervention and leading to lots of cost savings. For example, AI-powered chatbots can handle frequently asked questions, customer in inquiries, and reduce need for large customer service teams. It's also great for improved decision-making. It can analyze large amounts of data, and it can improve insights and predictions and help with your decision-making processes. It can also give you an enhanced customer experience where it will personalize everything, analyzing each individual customer and look at their past buying habits and trends to allow for future purchases, which is really nice. Uh, a lot of people have issues about that when uh, it comes to privacy and our next speaker can talk a little bit about that. Uh, it also opens up new uh, possibilities for products and services, enabling businesses to innovate and stay competitive. The key to successfully implementing AI in small business is to start small, focus on a specific set of problems and, or an area of business and gradually expand as you see success with it. Many small businesses are leveraging AI today and they're using it to do things, excuse me, sorry about that, to enhance their operations. In general ways, they're using it. And sorry about that. Many small businesses are leveraging AI to enhance their operations. Here are some general ways in which small businesses are using AI. Remember, the key to reaping these benefits is not just implementing AI, but implementing it in a way that lines with your business goals. So they're using customer service, sales and marketing, product development, risk management, and for other things as well. This slide breaks out different sectors of how people are using uh, AI. It's very hard to read, it's really small, but to give you an example, it talks about real estate, healthcare, online shopping, and we can make this slide available to you. So if you'd like to have a copy of it, you can refer to it, but there's a really uh, in-depth information on here as to what different sectors and industries are using. And it's one of those things where it allows you to see how good 
uh, and beneficial AI can be, and remembering the fact that it's a tool and uh, it can be used for good and it can be used for not so good. So having policies in place that dictate what you're going to be using it for will really help. Okay. What I want to talk to you about now is Microsoft 365 and a new product called Copilot. This is not public yet. It's still private. And what it is, is it has a large language model and it will allow you to take all of your normal applications such as PowerPoint, Excel, Word, and you'll be able to actually have AI used in a collaborative way and say, for example, you wanted to create a PowerPoint for you and take data from your Excel worksheets and then also incorporate Word documents, it can analyze all of that, put it in a beautiful presentation with images and completely automate the whole process, which is going to be a huge time saving for people. The nice thing about Microsoft and Google, they've always been around customers and customer collaboration and trying to allow people to work as easily as possible and keep track of things. So as you can see, it's very powerful and it's really great for collaboration. If you are like I am and you're on like Microsoft team or Zoom meetings all day long, and then you have all these people that are doing chats and everything, you can actually have the AI go in and summarize your whole conversation and create notes for you so it's easy to follow up and book future meetings and assign tasks to those people who need to have those tasks done. Businesses are employing artificial intelligence in a variety of ways to improve efficiencies, save time, and decrease cost. With continued advancements, AI is quickly becoming a precious resource for companies across industries. To better understand how businesses use AI, Forbes Advisor surveys 600 business owners utilizing the planning to incorporate how to find out what works in AI for them. The results revealed AI's impact on areas such as cybersecurity, fraud management, content production, and customer support, including the use of chatbots. Some of the key takeaways were over half of the business owners are using artificial intelligence for cybersecurity and fraud management. One in four business owners are concerned about AI affecting their website traffic. And almost all, 97% of business owners believe chat GPT will help their business. And also 44% uh, are going to be using chat GPT to write content for their websites, not only in English, but other languages as well. It's a great tool for that to translate into foreign languages. Nearly half of the business owners use AI to craft internal communications and 40% are concerned about over-dependence on technology due to AI use. Nearly two-thirds, 64% of business owners believe AI is going to improve their customer relationships. Businesses are using AI to improve the customer experience. It's playing a significant role in enhancing customer experience across touch points. According to Forbes Advisor Survey, 73% of businesses use or plan to use AI-powered chatbots for instant messaging. Moreover, 61% of companies use AI to optimize emails, while 55% deploy AI for personalized services such as product recommendations. Businesses also leverage AI for long-form written content such as website copy, 42% personalized advertising, and AI has made inroads into phone call handling as 36% of respondents use or plan to use AI in this domain. 49% utilize AI for text message optimization and following up with customers. With AI increasingly integrated in diverse customer experience, it's becoming more efficient and personalized. The majority of business owners expect AI will have a positive impact on their business. Most business owners think it will benefit. Most 64% anticipate it will improve their customer relations and 60% expect AI to drive sales growth. AI is perceived as an asset for improving decision-making, decreasing response times and avoiding mistakes. 
Businesses also expect AI to help them save costs and streamline job processes. Remember, AI is not here to replace us, but rather to augment our abilities and free us to do what we do best, to be creative, to innovate, and to think strategically. So keep learning, keep exploring, and keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible with AI. The future is exciting, and it's all yours to shame. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So we've got five minutes for questions. So uh, please raise your hand and Natasha can give us a heads up if we have any online questions. Yes. When is uh, Microsoft Copilot and Google Duet going to be available to the public? Uh, that's a good question. They started uh, testing it. And right now, I believe that you can, if you can get into, there's beta versions of both of those that are running right now. Uh, I'm not sure exactly as to when they're going to open it up, but I would say fairly soon. They're just trying to work the kinks up. Lon? Uh, when I was growing up, and, uh, sorry, I should say, I don't know how old. Uh, when I was growing up, I remember. Uh, a teacher of us talking about when the uh, the steam machine was invented, there was a pretend there was a fork in the road. We could work less and produce as much, and we could also produce more, which we chose. Uh, how are we going to uh, prevent AI from uh, increasing the expectation? Or prospective customers that everything should be instantaneous without uh, loss of uh, control with products or with release. That's a fabulous question, and I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I, I think our the policies and the laws that are going to be created around AI are still in the infancy phases, and it's really hard to determine what that's going to be like. I know that uh, with the use of technology and automation, much people have been much more efficient in their regular everyday duties and they've been able to achieve a whole lot more than they used to in a shorter amount of time, which ends up making them work longer hours and doing more. Yeah. And so that's a question that really needs to be thought about. It's like, what's fair and what's not fair? Um. Have, has there been any studies that factor in customer satisfaction okay. rates with the application of automated customer service? I feel like over time, customer satisfaction has gone downhill. You get sick of not being able to talk to a person. And I'm just curious if there, have you read any studies along the I, I've read a few studies and actually a lot of people prefer to speak with a human being instead of interacting with a chat bot. And there's a number of businesses that are forcing their customers into a certain way of being responded to. And it could cost companies potential business as a result of that. I, I think it's too early on to say right now, it's, it's such a brand new field for many of us that I don't think those decisions have been made yet. Richard? Um, it's interesting because I, I do a lot with generative AI. And I think the big difference when you talk about AI versus generative AI. Uh, but the demographics, the people that want to use the winner of AI that respond to it is, for me, the biggest market out there. And I attract customers that I'm attracted to it. And if they're not, they're not my customer. So that's a great point. Yeah. Right? So I think it's important to note that. And if you're a business owner, what direction are you going to head? And I can tell you, as a, uh, I don't know, a commercial insurance firm in the Northwest. That we're out pacing my competition by a lot. I think I, my opinion is, is that there is a lot of the AI can do that helps customers to have their answer questions answered without them really realizing it. <laughs> so like they, it can provide a lot of information up front where normally we would have to actually talk to someone to get that information prior to AI. And then, but once it gets to the point where the person is like, I need this problem solved and I'm not getting my answers already, then yes, you want to talk to a person. But I think that the the, the instances of that are extremely reduced because there's so much available and questions answered prior to that that AI can provide. So, I, I mean, I did, I spent 10 years in customer service to so a call center 
And most of the questions that we answered could have been resolved with something like this. And I bet customers would just be just as happy because it was so simple. But there were some really complex situations that we would have to discuss with them. And, and that's great. I don't think that you can, I don't think that it's here to replace a human. It's just here to make the human's job more effective. If that makes any sense. I, I see it as a as a tool, and you know, there's always an exception to the rule. And you know, some people you can have ninety percent of the people love it, and then one person can say, "Oh, we hate it; it's horrible." Um, I, I think that's something that people have to make personal decisions about, and companies really need to think about these things before they roll out these programs and maybe have small tests with a certain subset of customers before they roll it out to a huge company-wide policy. Lada? So business comes to you and they're like, okay, we want to start doing some AI for automation for our, our business. Where do they begin? What is some, like, where do they go? What do they download? Where, where does someone begin? Well, uh, there, there's a number of ways you, you can go to chat GPT and you can sign up for a free account. Uh, what's really interesting, a lot of people don't know that Bing Chat uses uh, 4.0 for free. And so if you go into Bing Chat and you start typing, it actually uses the latest resources and uh, it's actually going to be all rolled into the whole co-pilot situation. But right now you can use Bing Chat for free and it will give you the uh, 4.0. You can use 3.5 with the uh, free chat GPT. And then I think it's like $20 a month or something roughly for the 4.0 chat GPT through open AI. There's another yeah. one called Bard. Yeah, there's Bard as well, and there's yeah. Jasper, and there's a number of different oh, ones available that are, and they're all, you know, have their own place. Some are better than others. Yeah. One of the ones that has come up is a Claude yes. AI. And what I liked about that when I read about it uh, is that they are doing a risk assessment to determine <clears throat> what is, uh, it, it goes down the path of what is harmful or what is not. And they're looking at the things that were could be misused and 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 looking at that on the front end. Um, and so I checked that one out, Claude AI. Yes. AI.com. Anyway, uh, I found that one to be useful as well. That's a that's a great one, one more question, Eric. We got okay. Thanks, Eric. Um, so with the recent update to Microsoft, yeah, there was a big uh, utility up in the corner. Yeah. So I've been tapering around with that. The first question was. How are they going to monetize this? Yeah. Uh, but then is, is Copilot and Duet their path to monetizing it because it's an enterprise product? Uh, there is pricing. Certain Microsoft plans will include it, like uh, E3 and E5 will have it as part of it. Some of the lower end products, you can add it on as an addition. Uh, they have announced pricing just recently, but they haven't rolled it out yet. So I think we're, we're in a space where that's all to be determined. Uh, I, I think that through the subscriptions is where they're going to make their money. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, And hey, just want to point out, we still have a little bit of food left for lunch, so I encourage you guys to uh, grab some. It's, it's really good. It's from Creme and Bloom, and we want to thank the lunch sponsor, Zipply Fiber, for providing that. <clears throat> Next, I would like to introduce Chuck Dinsfriend from, with Willamette Lane. Chuck is the Information Technology Manager for Willamette Lane Park and Recreation District. He has over 25 years experience as an information technology leader in K-12 education, nonprofit, and park and recreation organizations. He has focused on cybersecurity and disaster recovery, business continuity, as well as system integration of hybrid cloud and on-premises systems. He holds an MBA from World Institute of Religious Education, as well as certifications from ITIL, Novell, Microsoft, and others. He has spoken at three International Society for Technology and Education conferences, as well as presentations at several regional conferences. Please help me give a warm welcome to Chuck, to Chuck Dinsfriend. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. 
I am Chuck, and thanks for having me. I have to say that uh, when Marianne first approached me to do this, I came up with a title, which was uh, Generative AI, A Lighthearted Look at the End of the World. However, I was discouraged from doing that, and I changed the title to Generative AI, uh, a, a, a Look at the Dark Side. <laughs> and I changed that to Generative AI, how to be safe and secure. That's the one that finally got it. So, but I am going to take a lighthearted look at the end of the world. Oh, thank uh, you. As soon as I figure out where's the sharing button, share it's screen. Really hard. It's at the bottom. <laughs> I know, and I can't find it. Share screen. Oh, there it is, the green one. The one that's really obvious. All right. And then we want to do all five. Start a slideshow from the beginning. And hopefully this will work. It did not. There we go. Now I can see. I see my notes. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, generative AI, how to be safe and secure. I just flew in from Missouri. I was gone for a week and I hit four different airports in my trip. And every single airport had huge displays saying Watson X, AI, machine learning, it's just everywhere. It's pervasive. I was shocked at how pervasive it was. Also, during the last week, last Wednesday, Meta, the parent company of Facebook, announced at their um, annual developers conference that they're all in for AI. They're going to do it in every app, everywhere. They're going to, they've already contracted with some famous people like Snoop Dogg to use their images for, you know, AI and deep faking stuff. So it gets pretty weird. Uh, in addition to that, well, I'll, I'll share more later on, on uh, some of the other things that happened with just in the last couple of weeks. It's changing so fast. It's just incredible. So, and I believe AI is a fantastic and extremely valuable tool with any tool, any new tools. It's important to understand how to use it safely and securely. And so the agenda is an introduction, what to do about AI, lock it or block it or teach it and preach it. Uh, I'm a fan of teaching and preaching myself. And what are the risks of AI? and then education and training, and then the fun part is the future. And so a little bit about me, I've got 27 years. I, 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 I wrote that and I still messed up. I lost track, so at least I'm not up to 40 years yet. But anyways, I've been leading technology in K-12 and, and, and so forth. I'm a certified CTO mentor for the state of California. I tell V3, as you mentioned. I'm also a musician, composer, and artist. And I love to promote my art and music on the web. So I'm a crypto slash NFT slash web three nerd. So if anybody knows what those are, you can see me after. Yeah, I'm a nerd, I admit it. In fact, my son the last week told me being a nerd is cool these days anyway. So, so what to do about AI? Well, how many of you, how many of you have used ChatGPT? Probably everybody, almost everybody. That's good, that's amazing really, because like, uh, uh, Eric said it was adopted, a million users adopted like in a day or something ridiculous. It was incredibly fast. So the first thing to do is assess the risk. You need to understand what the risks are that you're engaging in. As soon as you start typing in that chat bot, you've opened the door to risk. So we want to understand and assess those risks. Then you want to develop policy. If you're a small business or even a larger business, you should have policies and then implement training. So what are the risks? Well, they're manifold. Uh, Data leakage is probably the primary one. Loss of proprietary information or intellectual property. I can read the list. Misinformation campaigns, personal identifiable information getting leaked. Deep fakes, those are fun. That's when your voice, your image, but not your thoughts are portrayed. They had uh, Putin and the, uh, and the uh, guy from uh, Ukraine actually saying different things that weren't true about their wars. And, you know, that's scary what they could actually cause a lot of people to do things that they shouldn't be doing based on information from the president that wasn't what he really said. False information, just flat out wrong data. I don't know if anybody's used ChatGP input a prompt and got something that was completely wrong. I have, and I was helping my son with his uh, college level uh, work, just some uh, assessing reviews. And I typed this thing about a book and I handed it to him. He says, well, that's great, but it's all wrong. Just came right out of chat GPT. You just, you just don't know. That's why it's very important. I'll say this once, I'll say it again. Always have a human intervention. Review your output before it goes public. Absolutely cool. It's only a tool and you're the purveyor or the user of that tool. Um, mass layoffs. I don't remember exactly how they uh, portrayed that one, but imagine you know if the information goes out 
uh, saying that all grocery clerks are going to be replaced by AI. There's your mass layout. There's one. Uh, and copyright infringement, just accidentally grabbing the wrong stuff off the web. So those are some of the risks. That's not even all of them. There's more that I haven't thought. Of. I could ask Chat GPT what the risks are, and I would get a yeah. pretty thorough answer. Uh, so developing policy. This is uh, what I've done, and I'm happy to share these. I'm just going to click on these links real quick. And uh, we have an acceptable use policy. I think every business, no matter how large or small, should have an acceptable use policy to uh, explain how and where to use internet tools. And hopefully it'll open. And we're not seeing it. I have to share my screen differently, I guess. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just read a little bit. The policy establishes rules governing Willamette Park and Recreation District information systems and electronic communications. Its scope applies to everybody, all staff. And it says using it for, it's only to be used for Willamette Lane business purposes, not to be used for harassing, threatening, obscene, pornographic, sexually explicit, defamatory, discriminatory, uh, anything racially, uh, in other words, all the bad stuff, those are prohibited. That's pretty standard. And you can just go on the web and grab a uh, a uh, a template for these things. They exist. I'm trying to get back to my presentation. Here we go. Well, this is interesting. The uh, Zoom bar is in the way. Yeah. There we go. And now we should be back to it. No, well, I'm really stuck. There we go. Finally, okay, good. Uh, we have uh, the, the second item. I won't go there because obviously it's too complicated for me to handle. But the AI guidance is a document that we shared, I believe, with the uh, chamber, uh, and that is. Uh, Guidelines. It talks about appropriate use, what kind of data you don't ever want to put into a chat bot, and uh, especially uh, making sure that you have human review the output before you use it, and making sure that you uh, get trained on appropriate use. So it just talks more specifically about these, uh, uh, how to use a chat, uh, these uh, primarily generative AI tools. So um, I'm happy to share those, you know, post uh, meeting if you would like to see them. And then our documents were actually generated from my membership with the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the MSI SAC, which is a spinoff of CISA, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which is part of Department of Homeland Security, DHS, all alphabet soup, right? But anyways, uh, one of the uh, CISOs over at Boulder County in, in Colorado shared this document and it's very thorough, it's more, uh, all encompassing than my document, but you can actually grab it. He's publicly given or given me permission to share publicly, and you're welcome to use it however you will. So that's uh, that was the uh, policy part of it. Then the teaching. So we uh, use a program in our organization called Skill Sets Online, which is fairly good. It's uh, online training, and they recently came out with Chat uh, GPT, a whole course. So, oops, I'm late. Um, chat GPT and its practical use cases. That's the first one. I got a 92% on that one. I just took it. And I'm going to put in our policy that staff that want to use chat GPT should at least take that first course. It's not long. It's only an hour or so. And then there's even more advanced courses. As you can see, we have mastering chat GPT prompts, which Eric mentioned. Prompting is the key to the whole thing, writing really good specific prompts. And then even, uh, you know, advanced prompts and so on. And then the last one, which I feel is super important, is the ethical privacy and intellectual property considerations for ChatGPT. Those are all great courses. And I uh, encourage you to either find skill sets online and see what you can do with them. There's also free stuff available on YouTube, but it's all about being continuously learning and educating yourself. And since it's changing so rapidly, it's really important to stay in touch with, uh, with what's going on. So the lock it, block it mentality, when I first got into IT 30 years ago, roughly, um, in schools, we were blocking YouTube, we were blocking social media, even though it didn't exist then, but they blocked it as soon as it came out. And uh, that's not the right thing to do in education. What you have to do is have a balance between safety and security. So I became one of the teach it, preach it guys and come up with policy that allows things like YouTube and social media in schools. Uh, however, 
many of these businesses you see listed here actually had serious problems and they're blocking it. And this came out, I don't know, about two months ago in the news. And we started looking at whether we should block it or not. And that's when we started developing our policy and having some guidelines on use. I'm not saying you should block it. I'm just saying that these folks did. And for good reason, Samsung is the one that actually lost proprietary uh, programming data because one of their engineers decided to ask ChatGPT, how do I write this code? Mm -hmm. And it was out there. And then it was out there for other people to get. And so they are blocking. And for probably for good reason, I think the banking industry has got some uh, issues with loss of funds. That might be the reason to keep people out. But other than that, I'm a big believer in, in, in uh, AI. So as we get further into this, I'm going to present the dark side, but I'm, I'm a believer in the light. So you don't want to talk about creepy. Read AI, read.ai is a program that I actually tried out for my team. It, it integrates with Zoom, it integrates with Teams, and what it does is it's a note taker. <laughs> you read between the lines. So what I found out was it was profiling attitudes, voice inflection, tone, and word choice. In addition to that, your voice now is in the wild. It's not, it's just publicly out there. So uh, imagine your voice being used for any number of nefarious things. Uh, and in addition to that, and, and Eric mentioned this, there's new applications launched daily that you can, as far as blocking things, if you block ChatGPT, someone's going to come up again with another one. It's like whack-a-mole. So blocking isn't really a good policy. Teaching and preaching is better because there's so many new ones. Um, I can't see my notes. <laughs> oh, well, I really don't need them. Let me get rid of this thing, it's in the way. There we go, now I can see my whole thing. Um, so um, in the, uh, I'm good at it. it looks weird on my screen, but I'm up there, it's good. This is actually from our IT meeting. My team said, we're not using that ever again because our voices are out there and it's bad and they weren't happy with it. And I was looking at this uh, chart and it shows you um, all the voices are recorded, everything's recorded, but it talks about participant scores engagement, sentiment, charisma, bias, and word choice. And so it got, that's pretty weird. I mean, we were just like, okay, it's helpful. Also, it talks about the tempo and speed of your mm -hmm. presentation, which can be helpful. There's a lot of good things about that, but there's a little bit of scariness about it too. But the bad thing about Read Dead AI, and I wish I had my notes so I could read it word for word, but I'll just do it from memory, is their terms of service say that their uh, data can be stored in any country, not just the U.S., which I think, especially for a government agency like us, we stick with U.S.-based store uh, servers. Um, smaller businesses is not as big of an issue, but still, you want to stick with it. You don't want your stuff in Russia or China. Um, so their terms of service are bad. All your data, your recordings, or everything are out there in the wild to be used by anybody else that happens to find them. And uh, the other thing is the... Uh, uh, oh, the age of 18. So it's required that you have to be 18 or over to use it. So if there's anybody under 18 within your organizations, don't use it. But always read the terms of service on these programs that you use to make sure you're not running into something like read.ai, really a nightmare. Other tools that use artificial intelligence. Well, Grammarly, how many, use, how many of you use Grammarly? That's AI. And who knows, I believe their data is private. But, and you mentioned some of the uh, other AI programs like uh, Microsoft's, which one's it called? Copilot. Copilot. That's a private AI, which is good. So as we move forward, look for those AI tools that are private as opposed to publicly stored. Those are risky when they're in the public. All these are mostly like word, uh, word um, aids, but search engines, you mentioned Bing, all the search engines are gonna be using it. Shopping apps, absolutely using all the customer service apps. You're talking to a bot. It's not a person. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Those are all good things, but it's just things you need to be aware of, where your data is and where it's going. Now for the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. The unknown long-term risks. Does anybody know what a technological singularity is? We have a couple of hands. So I'm gonna explain it really simply. And then anybody familiar with quantum computers? I haven't got one yet, but I'm waiting. They tell me that teleportation and time travel will be possible with quantum computers, but I'll wait to be, let someone else be the guinea pig on those. And then I'll talk a little bit or look at a little bit of what top AI execs are saying. So the singularity is the point in time, the technological singularity is that point in time where machine intelligence exceeds human intelligence. 
Now, some people think it's already happened. Some scientists think it's already happened, while others are predicting it's around 2050 is when it would happen. And you'll see that transhuman, that just means that it's a human that has taken on some sort of technological cyber uh, attachment to either to their brain or something. So it improves their intelligence uh, technologically. So they're not really human anymore. They're transhuman. And that's not even anything I want to get too far into. However, once that singularity occurs, what can happen? Did you say 2050? 2050, yeah. 2050 is when they expect it to happen. Some people think it's already happened. Um, I don't know. <laughs> don't ask me that question. But uh, the consequences of a technological singularity, well, it could, if the machines become smarter than we are, their goals and uh, the things that drive the machine to do what it does could deviate drastically from what human desires and goals are. And you just don't have control over them. At some point, when they're outperforming us, they're smarter than us, and then these things accelerate so fast, you don't even have a chance to stop them. So it's quite frightening. And so for that reason, we need to, you know, some some of the experts are saying, put the brakes on. Yeah. I'm saying, let's just do it. Let's do it with knowledge and understanding and, and, and planning and foresight. So what happens? Well, you add quantum computers to that. Now, quantum computers are uh, basically, it's a, three phase, well, computers are ones and zeros, quantum computers are one zeros and something else, a third thing. It exponentially increases the power of computers. And I mentioned teleportation and time travel, tongue in cheek, but I've actually seen presentations talk about those things. Hang on, on these people. How dare you call me during my presentation? It's not zeros, what's the other thing? So, uh, well, ones and zeros, uh, it's a, a third state. Cut, yeah, qubits. Qubits are three state instead of one. There's no true explanation for it. It's just something. Yeah, uh, you could spend all day talking about it. Yeah, we won't. Exactly. Yeah. But at any rate, the power. When you take the power of a quantum computer and put AI in it, who knows what could happen? I mean, that's just an incredibly powerful tool in the hands of AI. So I think controls need to be built into AI to protect humanity from what could happen. Here's what top executives are saying, and I want to read that. But that statement right there is in this website. Say, wait, wait. I don't touch it, touch screen. Anyways, <laughs> mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. I'm just saying, I didn't, I didn't make this stuff up. And that's from www.safe.ai, statement on AI risk. And these gentlemen are all pioneers and experts in the field, and they are signing this document saying, we need to be careful here. And Elon Musk, everyone knows him. He was quoted in a recent interview saying it's the civilization destruction. So, and that's what the moon crashing into the earth. I love that. Fun stuff, you know. So these are what the top execs are saying. These are the people that CEO of OpenAI. That's a chat GPT company. Uh, Google DeepMind is their uh, their uh, AI. So and Bill Gates, everybody knows him. And AI is everywhere. It's in social media. It's online shopping, customer call centers. I learned here at our session a couple of months ago or a month ago that radio station DJs, I don't remember who said it, but I didn't hear of that one. It's in your car. It's on your phone. It's in your home. You know, all those smart devices you have and on your body if you have a watch or a Fitbit. So, I mean, it's already there. It's already out there. The cat is out of the bag. Pandora's out of the box. So what are we going to do? And I mentioned... Uh, some of the stuff that happened last week. Well, on the 18th of September in Salem, Oregon, Agility Robotics announced the first humanoid robot production facility in Salem, Oregon. Yeah. They're doing it. It's already happening. Now, robots and AI are, and think about it. AI is just simply, a robot is simply AI on feet or wheels. So, you know, that's uh, something to be concerned about. And I'm sure they're developing safe uh, safety things in, 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 into their programming, but are they? We don't know. Well, who monitors these guys? Who, what? who monitors these guys? Nobody. So there you go. Yeah. Well, and then, so I am a I'm a futurist. I believe in a good, bright future. And Isaac Asimov is an author, is a professor, scientist, speaker. Um, he wrote the three laws of robotics, I think, before I was born. So maybe maybe 50 or 60 years ago. A robot may not injure a human being. And you can instead of saying robot, just think AI. 
may not injure a human being or be or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given it by a human being, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. It's simple, but it's really, really solid. This has been uh, reviewed and vetted by thousands, if not more, of uh, scientists and so forth. And so I'm a big believer. I think this is the key. I think this is the thing that needs to be implemented into AI and robotics going forward. And a Honda made a robot that actually can run. And they named it a CMO. It's a nod to Isaac Asimov. And if you saw iRobot, Relaw is safe. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. All right, just a couple minutes for questions. Sure. Um, I'm curious about how ethics play into offering AI services to clients. For example, you know, somebody hired me to write a script and AI gave me like the best script ever. I would feel like I would have to disclose that that was, it's just like giving somebody, oh, I made this sweater when you really didn't make the sweater, you're, but somebody else made oh, it. Yeah. It's like that idea. And to me, there's there should be some kind of an ethics umbrella over service-based AI uh, uh, I agree. offerings. I think, I, you know, that's a, uh, my point of how, how do you um, deal with the, uh, what's the word where you're copying? Right. Yeah, plagiarism. Yeah, plagiarism. Thank you. When you're dealing with plagiarism, so I actually started my PowerPoint presentation. I went to ChatGPT to help me write a PowerPoint for this, and it wasn't very good. And I said, well, that's kind of a good starting point, and I threw it away and just did my own. But if you were to write a book or write an article or do something that you were hired to do, um, I would disclose that I use ChatGPT, but like I said earlier, you have to put the human touch to it. If you just take ChatGPT output and use it, it's a pretty much not good. And you'll find that it's not good. So I would say disclose it. It's just like when you put in uh, uh, on a uh, report or document, the www a bi bibli bibliography. So my source, so I would treat it the same way. And I think that's part of the ethics too. And so, yeah, bibliography. In, in parallel to that, at the beginning, you mentioned something about the, the quality of the prompt is what makes the answer the quality. So I guess if your book is very good, it's because your prompt was good. Exactly. There's no point in, in crediting a machine. I'm not crediting the hammer because the nail is so well placed. Right. Because it's pointless. That's so, yeah. That's a really valid point. I agree. One more question. Anything online? Okay. Right, well, thank you so much, Jack. Well, thanks everyone for joining both in person and virtually. Let's give one more round of applause to today's speakers. Again, I want to thank our title sponsor, Kaiser Permanente, as well as our investors of the Small Business Solutions Hub. Ask Eric Computer yeah. Services, Belfour Property Restoration, Chambers Construction, Eugene Area Radio Stations, Kirshner Hunter, Hutchinson Cox, OCCU, and Wapen Bank. Let's also give a huge thank you to Zipley Fiber for sponsoring the delicious food from Crema and Bloom. And quick reminder, uh, continue to check out our digital resource hub for more resources and programs. And uh, Thank you very much.